morning church today I want to talk about what does it mean that we're stuck at home that we're staying at home that we're hid away in so many ways why because we're afraid we're questioning what the future looks like we're wondering what lies ahead for us not just in the days, but in the months and maybe even years to come. We're at home. I'm at home. I'd much rather be in the sanctuary with you and giving God praise and singing and doing all the things we're so used to doing. But for now, we're at home. And we're here for a good reason. But I'd like to suggest to you today on this week after Easter that we're really not a whole lot different than what was going on with those disciples in the weeks, the days after the resurrection. I think oftentimes we have this picture of the disciples coming and finding the empty tomb and they ran away praising God. Oh, hallelujah, he's risen, he's alive. But the evidence says something completely different. The evidence, as we read through the scriptures, says that that's not what happened at all. <coughs> A group of them uh, stayed at in Jerusalem and they hid away. They went back and they were in a they were in an upper room somewhere, maybe where they had had their last supper with Jesus, where they had celebrated the Passover. And others, they simply packed up and headed home. There's a great story in Luke chapter 24 about two men who leave and are on their way to to the city of Emmaus, a day's walk, and they're walking home, and as they walk, um, this man walks up along with them, who they don't recognize as Jesus, but as he walks with them, and they're, they're talking about what has happened in the last couple of days. And uh, what are you talking about, he asked them. Are you the only one in Jerusalem who doesn't know about these things? What things? He asks. I, I, I have to laugh almost every time I read through that story. I can just see Jesus asking that question. What things? And so they begin to tell him what had happened. How this one who they thought was going to lead them to a, a future of freedom and justice and, and, and set the people free had instead found himself arrested, beaten, crucified, and laid in a tomb. And then maybe the most fantastic part of the story is they look at him and say, but this morning something happened that's confused us. Some women came and told us that they had seen Jesus and he was alive. And others went and found the tomb just like the, the women had told us. And we're wondering what all this means. Well, that's the world we live in today too, isn't it? We're wondering what all of this means for us. And so we're in a place that's much different than where we'd choose to be. My guess is the disciples had been thinking about <clears throat> a journey home uh, or, or maybe staying in Jerusalem and enjoying a few days holiday as they gathered around celebrating the Passover and, and meeting with family and friends, worshiping in the temple, praising God for what God was doing. And they're really... Their expectation was that maybe just Jesus was going to proclaim himself the king, the king of the Jews, and, and set them on the road to freedom. And yet all these things that have been described, that's what happened. 
And so as those men walked on towards home and they got near Emmaus, they, Jesus was going to walk on, keep on going, and they said, come and stay with us. And so Jesus went and, and he sat down to have a meal with them. And when they had that meal, it was in the breaking of the bread that they realized that this man who had been describing the scriptures of the old stories that they had known since they were children and who had made them come alive on the road was actually Jesus. And they were amazed. A part of that story is that Jesus was gone. We know that Jesus, in another gospel, we're told that that very evening he appeared to the disciples. And they were amazed as he stood there in the air midst and warned them of what was yet to come. That they should go on about life and that he would join them again. And over, over the next few weeks, he would continue to appear to them and shape who they were going to become. The question I have for us today is, who are we going to become? What are we going to look like? What, are the, what is the church going to look like when we come to the other side of this time in our lives? None of us would have chosen this time. We <clears throat> would have preferred that, that the routines of life would have just continued on. But they're not. And it's not likely that life will return to normal at least for a few more weeks or maybe even a few months. I know I've had a lot of conversation with people that are saying, well, I don't really care what the politicians decide. I'm, I'm going to be careful. I'm really not anxious to gather with a lot of people uh, as much as I enjoy that. I want to be careful because I want to be safe. So we don't know what the future is going to look like. But we do know one thing. Just like those disciples, Jesus is preparing us for a future that probably looks different than we expected it to look. The one thing I've been encouraged by is just because we've not been gathering in our buildings for worship, we're still having the opportunity and taking advantage of truly being the church. Almost every day I talk to somebody who tells me a story about a way someone from the church reached out to them. The way somebody within the life of the church made a difference in their life. Yes, people are still getting sick. And while I can't visit them in the hospital like I used to, while I can't be there before somebody has surgery to pray with them. I did have the opportunity this week to spend a few minutes with somebody just shortly before they entered the church triumphant and passed from this life into eternity. That's always a sobering moment for me. When I'm with somebody or I hear that they have gone on to claim their eternal reward. And the truth is that all of us one day are going to be there. And the question that we need to be asking ourselves is, are we ready? Are we ready for that day when we take our final breath on this earth and enter into the eternity and the presence of our Creator? That's a really important question for every one of us. Now some, when they hear me tell these stories of Jesus, they, they laugh or, or some will even mock me and make fun of me. How foolish this is. Well, both Jesus and the Apostle Paul said that that would happen, so we shouldn't really be surprised, for it does seem like an incredible story. But there's one thing I've learned over the course of my life, 
now covering more than six decades, is that much of life changes. And while I don't always like those changes that occur, they still come. And while those changes often are not what I'd like us to see, they're the changes that I have to deal with. God has often got a very different plan. I, I sometimes say, well, I plan and God laughs. Because oftentimes where God takes me or wants, sends me, wants me to go, is not where I would have chosen to go. Well, I think that was true for most of the disciples that surrounded Jesus. The apostles would begin to take and build the church that we still celebrate today. I want you to think about that today. That that small cluster of men and women that gathered in Jerusalem and then began to spread out and they began to tell the story. They, while they were hidden away for the next several weeks, while they were accepting the challenge of, uh, of trying to figure out who they were and what, what they were, they were they, the God was shaping them in to be the leaders of the church that was yet to come. And since then, that story has been handed down but the most important part of that story isn't just the story, it's the witness that has been developed as God has done mighty work in, in our lives in so many different ways. And as God has done work in our lives, we begin to share that story, how God transformed us and changed us into who we are today. God is changing us. God is shaping the church of the future, not the church that's comfortable and, 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 and hidden away, but the church that's disturbed, that's, that's sent out into the world. And you and I have an opportunity to be a part of that church. And so while we're not where we'd like to be today, where, where we're, we're at home or, 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 or wherever you are, God is still at work in our midst. And he's shaping the church of tomorrow. I truly believe that. What we're learning in these days as we have time to dwell upon the scripture, as we have time to look upon what God is doing in our lives and teaching us in this time, while we take advantage of this time together, then I hope that whatever God has planned for us changes our lives in such a way that when we do gather again in our sanctuaries for worship, we have tremendous praise for God because He has done a tremendous work in us in teaching us to be the church. And so I don't know what God is teaching you God's been teaching me a lot of different things. I'm learning to use tools that I never expected to have to know. I'm learning to do things differently than I've ever done them. I'm learning to wait upon God. For a guy like me who's used to going out and getting things done, that can be a really big challenge, hard to do. But God is using that time to shape me for tomorrow. And the day after and the week after that. And the days to come. I'm not sure what the future holds. But God has it in his hands. God is aware of what the future holds. And has a magnificent plan for those of us who love him. And so I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to put your faith in an incredible God who even overcame death and made a symbol of death and pain, that of the cross, and turned it into a symbol of love, which today people wear as jewelry and put them on buildings. <coughs> we put those 
crosses and, and, and wear them and, and, and expect them to be a part of our lives. And we don't look at the cross with pain. We look at the cross, at least the majority of us look at it and think, wow, what a, what a symbol of love. But it was made a symbol of love because God was willing to even take his life on a cross for you and for me and to provide for a fantastic opportunity to begin again, offering us grace and forgiveness for that which has gone on before and a chance for new life, a new life lived to the glory of God and that is my challenge to you. Let's pray for just a moment. Lord, I thank you for the blessings that you have brought to us. I thank you for so much that you have transformed our lives in so many ways. And, and you are doing a work in us that we cannot see what the future holds. But the day will come when we will know better about what you expect of us. The opportunities, what we've learned through this process about ourselves, about one another, about the church, and about our community, about our friends and family uh, that live around us. We're learning, we're learning so much about them. We're learning who we can trust and, and, and who cares. We're learning about how you have done a mighty work in us. And so today, O oh Lord, as we gather before you, fill us with your mighty spirit that we might be receiving the peace of your love and care. And Lord, just like those disciples on their way to Emmaus, might we see you in one another. May we see the, the face of, of God, the, the image in who in <clears throat> who we have been made so that we have an opportunity to share the good news that God loves us in the midst of all of this. And we'll give you the praise even as we come together and pray as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thou art the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever and ever. Amen.